Hello, everyone. If you've been watching my YouTube channel for a little while, you know that I've gone back to university and every now and again, I have the lucky opportunity to make a video talking about some literature that I am very interested in and to combine that with one of my university projects, I suppose you would say. And that happy confluence of events has happened once again. That today's video, I'm going to be able to talk about some literature that I love as well, I'm going to be able to, to do something for one of my university classes. And that class is second year creative writing class C R W R two three zero zero taught by Nathan Adler. The task for the class was to, to bring in a short story that you are fond of and that you would like to present to the class and explain to them why you think this is a worthwhile piece of literature, something interesting to read, or from a craft perspective, why you think this is something we should study in the hopes to make us better writers. So the short story that I wanted to bring in that I thought would be a good thing for my classmates to read, a story by John Cheever, The Swimmer. I came to John Cheever quite late in life. When I discovered him, it was a revelation. It was like, wow, this author is writing the kinds of short stories. Those are the short stories I love the most. Conflict, characters, something beneath the surface that you need to consider, which is to say that he doesn't give it all to you on a silver platter. For me, that's one of the hallmarks of literature literature is that everything is not present. You know, it's that typical Hemingway iceberg theory that the story is not only the words on the page, it is also your consideration of the story. I think that is essential when it comes to literature. It starts off on this very picturesque day. There is a man named Neddy sitting there on the side of a swimming pool with a cocktail in his hand and he's just admiring the beauty of the day, the great good fortune he has as an American to be sitting there in the suburbs and enjoying this existence. Perhaps it is the gin. He takes it into his mind that he is going to swim from one of his neighbor's swimming pools to the next on this circuitous route home. And the distance is about seven miles, which is really far. That's a lot. That's a huge distance. But we don't mind. He's young, he's brave, he's sturdy, he's American, he's ambitious, he's got this wild idea and he's gonna do it. And, and just everything about the, the setup, the scenario, the beauty of the day tells us that this, this man is going to be successful in his wild ambition. However, we begin to notice that all of his grand ideas and all of his, his beautiful golden thoughts about what would occur seem to be falling apart. Like just for instance, he's thinking that he's really looking forward to getting to this one swimming pool. When he arrives there, he, he sees that actually the house is actually abandoned. You know, he's wondering like, where, where have they gone? I mean, it, it's strange that you know their house is closed up at this point in the summer quite unexpectedly he begins to feel cold and he he wonders like where where is this coldness coming from when i began on this grand journey i mean it was it was warm it was beautiful it was a gorgeous summer day and and suddenly puts that you know well you know i'm a bit exhausted i'm cold i'm into the swimming pool i'm out of the swimming pool i'm wearing a a bathing suit. Yeah, okay, maybe it's natural that I'm getting cold, but you know, we begin to feel the the fear and the worry, the anxiety that perhaps things are not as good as they ought to be. And from there, for the people who are not in my creative writing class at university, for my people who are watching me on YouTube, if you don't want any spoilers and you would like to know what happens yourself, you should stop watching the video now. Slowly, from swimming pool to swimming pool, he's getting weaker. The weather is becoming more cold and difficult to navigate. He is becoming less and less welcome at every subsequent location until he's begging. I started off with this plan of swimming back home and now I'm freezing cold. Won't you please just give me a bit of whiskey to get warm? Well, it's quite mysterious. Like what has been happening in the story? Like the key to the story is that it's, it's not about swimming. The story is about alcoholism. He is drinking and drinking and he's losing everything. And I would like to speak about John Cheever. I feel one of the most underrated American authors of all time. I think that's because he's mainly known for his short stories and not so much for his novels. I think his novels are amazing. It's just that he was quite known as 
the American short story writer. He was often featured in The New Yorker, and he was nicknamed the Chekhov of the suburbs. If you get this collection of the short stories of John Cheever, it is generally sold in this big, massive volume. Those stories are collected uh, chronologically, and you can see his development as a short story writer. His early short stories are a bit more playful. They're light. Picture of American life in the suburbs. And towards the end, they got much darker. Like this short story came later in his career, and it is quite a lot darker. It is about the, um, well, how alcohol destroys your life. And that is not an unusual theme in John Cheever's short stories, because John Cheever was a terrible, terrible alcoholic who went to rehab. However, he did get cured of it quite late in his life, perhaps a bit too late, but he did manage to give up alcohol and never drink for the rest of his life. Even though the damage might have already been done physically, you know, mentally, psychologically, that is great victory. However, you can really see the influence of alcohol in quite a lot of John Cheever's writing. More than almost any other writer, you can just feel that like the pages are soaking in gin and vodka and whiskey. Every story, there's something about um, cocktails and wine and beer and those old-fashioned cocktails that people used to drink when they wanted to get loaded really quickly. Manhattans or Rob Roy's or Sidecar. What else? Rusty Nail. Uh, young people in my creative writing class, if you want to get really wasted, forget the entire weekend. To have a Rusty Nail, yeah, you'll be a mess. Sometimes I wish I never went to bartender school. John Cheever's writing, there, there's a lot of alcohol, which that is symptomatic of his time and his era. That is, that is the era of a writer was a drinker. He was a hard-boiled, smoking, drinking, anything for the world experience. Yeah, give it to me. That was what a writer used to be. You know, alcohol was not his only trouble in his life. I, I was searching for a quote. I couldn't find it, but I believe his quotation was, I had always felt that I was 80% straight and 20% gay. And later in my life, I found out that it was exactly the opposite. John Cheever was married and he had a child. He had a daughter, but his sexuality didn't quite go in the typical heterosexual, what is it, manner, avenues. He was conflicted. Well, let me let me read you something that came from his daughter's describing her father's conflicted nature. Cheever's marriage was complicated by his sexuality. Variously described as gay, homosexual, or bisexual, Cheever had relationships with both men and women, including a short relationship with composer Ned Roram and an affair with actress Hope Lang. Cheever's longest affair was with a student of his, Max Zimmer, who lived in the Cheever family home. Cheever's daughter, Susan, described her parents' marriage as European, saying they were people who felt their feelings weren't necessarily a reason to shatter a family. They certainly hurt each other plenty, but they didn't necessarily see that as a reason to divorce. Yes, Cheever's life was a great deal of conflict. He did not make very much money during his life, even though today you can make quite a lot of money selling your short stories to the New Yorker. When John Cheever was doing it, it, um, it didn't pay as well as it does today. Terrible alcoholism. I think the last time that he went to rehab, the reason that caused him to give up alcohol so completely was that the experience of being in rehab scared the shit out of him. What he saw, and he said, well, that's what alcoholism looks like. I don't want that. I can't have that. I, I can't, I can't be like that. He was able to give up the, um, the curse of alcoholism late. He did give us some incredible short stories. The Swimmer is one of my favorites. There's another one, one of his most famous short stories that you're gonna see in quite a lot of American anthologies. There's one that's called The Enormous Radio, which I always thought was good, but a bit a bit hokey, a bit Twilight Zone for my taste. Please read John Cheever. If you go out and you get that big fat collection of short stories, read a few at a time. Don't read too many because like I find when, when you read the same author again and again and again, writing short stories, like you never ever wanna read that the entire collection of Ernest Hemingway short stories. That is, you don't want to do that. It's just too much of the same voice repeatedly. Same thing with John Cheever. Read a couple, put it away. I really recommend his novels, especially The Wapshot Chronicle. Do you see it over there? Yeah, like when I discovered John Cheever, I immediately wanted to read everything by John Cheever. 
it, it was like that. It was just like the voice was so, I don't know what it is. I, maybe it's just the, the very specific time that he was writing in, that 1950s, 1960s, people working in the city and they take the inner city commuter train back to the suburbs, have a cocktail and try to live your American life in the mid 20th century. He just wanted to show these portraits of American life as it was moving out into the suburban realm. Thank you for watching. This is Grant Loves Books. I'm gonna get an A. I know, I know, I'm gonna get an A. Probably an A plus. Nathan, what do you think? Pretty good, huh? Yeah, come on, that was good. That was a good presentation. Nathan, just um, wanted to talk to you about that, that music that you play at the beginning of the class. That's, um, did that dummy come in again 40 minutes late? There's this one student, he's come in 40 minutes late. It's not so much the 40 minutes late that disturbs me, it's the fact that he comes in and he's this tall lanky boy with this, you know, goofy eraser head hairdo. He serenades the entire class with the cracking of his knuckles quite loudly. And this is quickly becoming my biggest pet peeve because it seems that in every single one of my university classes, there is one individual who seems to really enjoy the explosive cracking of the knuckles. Do you not realize it is as though you just hoisted up your leg and shot out some massive farts? Do you think we want to listen to that? Like you, one after the other, like, yeah, yeah, gotta do them all, gotta crack every fucking knuckle. It is not something silent that is only operating in your ears. We all hear it very loudly. 